Hello again. Let's get officially started. My name is Martin Gritsch. I am the Associate Dean of the Kozakis College of Business. And the Associate Deans of all four colleges together um, were involved in the planning of this event. We were certainly not the only individuals. There's a lot of people to thank, uh, mainly facilities and the people who set up the technology and um, the food that you already saw as you walked in, which you will get to during the break. Um, but also, of course, all the presenters who will tell you about William Patterson University and what you need to know and the wonderful things we do here and things to be mindful of, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, b before we get to that, I want to really thank you for A, being here today and B, taking on this um, assignment as being an adjunct faculty member at William Patterson University. We are predominantly a teaching institution. You will hear about the profile of our students, some of their needs, some of the issues that they often face and many other things. So I think we have a lot of information for you in the next approximately three and a half hours. You hear from a different uh, set of, pre uh, uh, a varied set of presenters. And to kick us off, without any further ado, the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Joshua Powers, has opening remarks and a brief presentation. You don't even know me yet and you give me some applause. How about that? So, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is one of my, f my most favorite events to do every year because cause this is truly the heartbeat of the campus. I mean, you, you all are teaching, s there's probably a wider range of courses being taught in this particular room than any other room that I'm in because obviously full-time faculty have a more consistent load and those sorts of things. So it's just so great that we have such a great cross-section of folks here. Um, I also want to send, bring greetings on behalf of President Heldobler. He's normally here giving his greetings, but he's literally rehearsing for his State of the University address. So the first note I want to give you is you are welcome to participate. Um, you will see some messages about this. Um, it's on uh, Thursday, September 1st during the common hour, which is a term that you may come to hear as a moment when we don't schedule classes, um, from 12.30 to 1.30. So that would give you a chance to really get a feel for what's happening on campus, what are some of the exciting things that are coming. Um, so I just want to make sure that you're you aware of that. Um, so I want to welcome you to, or for some of you, perhaps welcome you back uh, to the university. Um, you know, it's been an extraordinary uh, sort of two years as we've navigated this thing called the pandemic. Um, and what was exciting during this period is, is, is you know, this challenge we're going through, you know, much of it is now in the taillights, which is certainly uh, helpful, but certainly it has changed us. Um, and as an industry sector that is not known for its responsiveness or innovation. So it really has been exciting, the things we've been able to do during this pandemic, that we can rise to the occasion and address the we needs we have for our students in particular, and the work that we do as faculty. Um, uh, so we have much to be proud of and pleased here at William Patterson, um, and we've strayed true to our core through all that with our students, while also navigating new and expanded ways with res respect to the ways that we deliver instruction and the curriculum that undergirds learning. Um, for example, we launched WP Online in April of 2020, and today enrolls more than 2,000 students, new students, who otherwise wouldn't or couldn't enroll here for any number of practical reasons. But let me just pause now um, and then probe you a bit to get to know you. So um, how many of you, this is your first time as an instructor here at William Patterson? Okay, excellent. All right, well, welcome. We're excited about that. Um, how many have taught before in another capacity, maybe as an adjunct at another institution or maybe in graduate school? Okay, all right, great, excellent. Um, how many have, for those of you that raised your hand, um, that this isn't the first time, how many have you, have you um, taught for two or three years as an, as a, perhaps as an adjunct somewhere? Okay, so we've got, got a few in the room. Um, how about for maybe four or more years in the room. Okay, so we got some great veterans, awesome here. So that give you a little insight in, as, we, as we get some chance to engage some of our veterans, hopefully can share some of their wisdom as well with those of you that, that are new. Um, how, many, how many are actually gonna be teaching exclusively in the online space here for William Patterson University? All right, great, okay, well that's exciting. We're glad that you're, you're here and that's an important contribution that we'll be making. Um, how many of you have been to this orientation before? 
None, okay. Occasionally we have a few veterans that, that come back, so that is, that's exciting. They're all, all of you are new. Okay. Um, so thank you for giving me that little window into, into you. Um, uh, I hope you'll find your work here at William Patterson rewarding. Um, and we'll actively lean on your chair. Are there any chairs in the room right now? Excellent. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you for being our representative chair. <laughs> okay. Um, they're here to help you acclimate and guide you over the course of the semester as you embark upon your teaching assignment. Let me also say that you will also have an opportunity to engage with our AFT faculty union team at the end of today, and they are also important guides and supporters of your success, and for which we have a good relationship with our, with our AFT um, here at the university. So whenever I'm out with others, um, and they ask about the university, they commonly inquire, you know, what's, what's, it, what's going on at William Patterson? What is it like to work there? Uh, you probably already have impressions, um, and we'll learn more from others in this workshop, but I'll just say a few of those things from my vantage point as provost. First, I find William Patterson an especially welcoming place, and with a pervasive and passionate belief and the transformative opportunities we provide students. Ones which are extraordinarily diverse, even by New Jersey standards, heavily populated by first-generation college students, and many who are low income. It's also a place that doesn't define what it means to be excellent in the traditional way, namely by how many we reject, as that has nothing to do with the quality of the educational experience here. Rather, it is defined by who is included in the kinds of transformative experiences that we provide our students. That's the regional state university mission in a nutshell, and what makes us different from many institutions in the state. Beyond there, I would point to the mantra you may have seen known as willpower. This phrase reflects both resilience and perseverance, something we routinely seek to facilitate in our students. It's also an expectation we have of one another. Your department colleagues are expected to support you in your success while you are expected to assert yourself in moments of potential ambiguity or in those moments when a class or a lesson plan just doesn't seem to go as the way you had envisioned, then to reflect on why. Regroup and try another approach, perhaps informed by your having reached out to a colleague for help. Good teaching is certainly not an end point, but rather a journey and of constant twists and turns. To that end, I want to share with you seven principles I think are essential for quality instruction. There is a rich literature on what makes for excellent teaching, and if you really synthesize it down, um, as folks have sought to do, it, really these seven things are, are anchoring elements. So I'm just going to pull them up on the screen so you can follow along as I speak about each of them. It's me right here. Nope, is that me? Not mine? Okay. Martin's going to get it for me. I just have one slide. Excellent. Okay. There you go. All right. So here are the seven keys, seven principles to excellent instruction. Now, I know instruction is not, it's not a simple thing, obviously. This is, as I said, it's a journey. But if you, if you remind about these things to yourself, uh, you will be much more likely to have success in the classroom and the students learn what's important. So let me just share a little bit on each of these. So number one, the instructor, and some of these are going to seem really intuitive to you, okay, but I really want you to think deeper about the meaning because it may sound intuitive and the degree to which we actually practice them can be two different things. The instructor encourages student-faculty contact and interaction. Frequent student contact in and out of classes is the most important factor in student motivation and involvement. Faculty concern helps students get through rough times and keep on working. Knowing a few faculty members well enhances students' intellectual commitment Encourage them, and encourages them to think about their own values and future plans. All right, so that's number one. Number two, the instructor encourages student cooperation. Learning is enhanced when it is more like a team effort than a race. 
Good learning, like good work, is collaborative and social, not competitive and isolated. Working with others often increases involvement in learning. Sharing one's own ideas and responding to others' reactions improves thinking and deepens understanding. So let me just say that what I'm doing right now and telling you this information is not the best teaching. Okay, and you all, I think, intuitively know that if we had lots of time, we would actually would engage these things individually, and that would be much better. But that's the point I'm making with that, with that item. And you'll see some of these parallels come in here, too. Number three, the instructor encourages active learning. Learning is not a spectator sport, like it is right now. Students do not learn much just sitting in classes listening to teachers, memorizing prepackaged assignments, and spitting out answers. Even though that feels maybe the easiest way to sort of get content. We have this great need to get this learning in my head into your head, and by telling folks it is not the optimal way to do that in most cases. They must talk about what they're learning, write about it, relate it to past experiences, and apply it to their daily lives. They must make what they learn part of themselves. Okay. Now, the biggest challenge to that is the fact there's so much stuff we want to stuff into a lesson plan, and we, gotta, we feel this compelling need to get that content out. Okay. And, and that's forever going to be a challenge. I, I know that. But it's better to take time to let them engage the content and learn it well than attempt to give them lots of content that they've only cursory come to understand if they've understood it at all. Okay. Number four, the instructor gives prompt feedback. Knowing what you know and don't know focuses learning. Students need appropriate feedback on performance to benefit from courses. In getting started, students need to help in accessing existing knowledge and competence. In classes, students need frequent opportunities to perform and receive suggestions for improvement. At, very point, at various points during college and at the end, students need chances to reflect on what they have learned, what they still need to know, and how to assess themselves. So. Um, how many of you are teaching at a thousand level f course for freshmen? Okay. Thank you very much. That is an honorable task and something we appreciate deeply. And as you obviously know, that's an important transition for the university. Um, one of the things we build into that experience, and you will be getting an email from me probably next week on this subject, um, is the importance of having an early assessment. This is true for any course, but it's particularly helpful for those new freshmen. They need to know early how they're doing. Okay. On a, on a, on an assignment or, a, or a, an assessment that is relatively low stakes. And it needs to happen in the first you know, three weeks, two weeks of the class. Okay? That's an important notion about giving feedback. And feedback's also not just about, here's what you did wrong. <laughs> you know, it's also about, here's what you did right. Okay? And imagine these new freshmen who already feel like, may feel like they're an imposter here, suddenly getting you know, some you know, the, hypothetical red, red ink on their thing. And you mean well, right? You want to help them do better. But if they, if they don't have a sense of what they've done well, it becomes more of a challenge. I know some of you teach classes that involve e exams that have you know, sort of you know, A, B, C, and D kind of selections. But the degree to which you can help them have a low stakes assessment and understand it, the better. And what's also important about that 1,000 level experience is that information that you enter into our banner system becomes available to their advisor. And what the advisors often say is students, they ask their students, how are you doing? And what do you think, how do you think the students respond? We're doing, f I'm doing fine. I mean, wouldn't you say the same thing? And they're like, well, let's actually un un unpackage that a little bit. Well, it looks like you're doing really fine in this class, but over here, maybe you're struggling a little bit. So imagine in their four or five classes, the, the advisors are getting that information and can be your partner in helping those students I don't know, discover that it's okay to ask for help and maybe go into a tutoring center. So those are some of the things that we have in place. Okay, number uh, five, instructor emphasizes time on task. Time plus energy equals learning. There is no substitute for time on task. Learning to use one's time well is critical for students and professionals alike. Students need help in learning effective time management, allocating Allocating realistic amounts of time means effective learning for students and effective teaching for faculty. I mean, you're, you're here, you were brought on board because you're good with your time, you know how to do these sorts of things, but students need some help in managing their time. Okay, uh, number six, instructor communicates high expectations. Expect more and you will get it. Think about all the ways that we signal to people, you know what, 
maybe you really aren't cut out for. And I tell you, the biggest detriment to this in higher education is we set up higher education to be thought of as a privilege, not a right. We have a right to a K-12 education, but we don't have a right to a college education. And for that reason, we actively, over 250 years, or even more subtly, signaled that, well, maybe you're not college material. And to be college material, you just need to be comfortable reading a 15-page syllabus and expect that on page seven, you know what's there. Okay, I'm sure that's just an archetype, you know, sometimes that can be frustrating for faculty, but uh, my point is, um, you know, you need to meet them you know, where they are and have high expectations that they can meet these assignments. So when you're given their feedback, being able to reinforce, I saw a lot of positive happen here, and you can do it. And college is hard work. There's a reason it's hard work. There's a reason why its return is $1.2 million over a lifetime of earnings, or on average, on average or $23,000 annually and a salary versus a person just has a high school degree. You know, we're investing in some, it's the number one thing you can invest in in life. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm pontificating there a little bit. The instructor respects diverse talents and ways of knowing. Number seven, there are many roads to learning. People bring different talents and styles of learning to college. Brilliant students in the seminar room may be all thumbs in the lab or art studio. Students rich in hands-on experience may not do so well with theory. Students need the opportunity to show their talents and learn in ways that work for them. Then they can be pushed to learning in new ways that do not come so easily. All right, so there's the seven. If you remember nothing else about my, my point, you'll get those, and, and uh, maybe you can give them a copy of the slide. Or if you just Google seven principles for a good practice in undergraduate education, I argue for graduate education too, um, uh, that you'll have them. Okay. So let me just close with the following. Um, I hope I've planted some seeds of curiosity that learning and teaching is a journey. Um, and uh, in a few moments, uh, you'll also have opportunity to learn from your colleagues on best practices in teaching and student retention. And perhaps one or more of these principles will anchor for you uh, in what they share. With that, I wish you the, your best in teaching, wish you the best in teaching experiences. While you may not teach as much as your other faculty colleagues, you are a critical instructional partner. What you do in the classroom and for students matters. Students don't know what your title is. That's irrelevant to them. They know that you are the instructor and you're the faculty member and they respect you for that. They don't, they don't have a sense for, for how that all works. Um, uh, and so by extension, you have a big opportunity to have an impact on them. So I hope you will. I hope it's positive and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Provost Powers, for those inspiring words. You've already heard and have seen a lot about teaching. What better way to now segue to a presentation from one of the co-directors of the Center for Teaching Excellence, which we have on campus for good reason. Uh, David Fuentes, he wears multiple hats. If you think, wait, I thought that was my associate dean, you're correct about that too. He's the interim associate dean of the College of Education and one of the two co-directors. Liz Brown, the other co-director, she cannot be here today because she's out of the country. But uh, I, I trust that David will do a good job to tell you about the wonderful things they do in CTE, as we call it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to WP on behalf of CTE. Uh, we represent the Center for Teaching Excellence, and we are all things resources for our faculty here. Um, Question for the audience, any suggestions? What do you think is the most important item between a teacher and a student? What is the most important relationship that you can have or, or, or perspective that you might have between a teacher and a student? Yes? Reciprocal learning, that's wonderful, absolutely. Any other thoughts? All right, so yes, go ahead. Do you guys trust you? Absolutely. Trust, sense of belonging. We'll hear a lot of that term as we think about the student experience here at WP. And one of the pillars that we focus on is student success. And so we'll be thinking about the relationship between a student's sense of belonging in the classroom and their student success. 
So research in pedagogy tells us that the most important dynamic between a teacher and a student is simply their relationship with each other. So how you make a student feel is what we call affect. The information that you deliver is obviously the reason that they're in your class with you. And that experience that they have in spending time with you is very, very, very important and meaningful for student success. So at the Center for Teaching Excellence, we're a resource here on campus that is all things teaching and learning. Um, we, we, we help faculty with thinking about assessment. We help faculty thinking about forming meaningful relationships with students. We focus a lot on diversity, equity, and inclusion here on campus. And in the classroom especially, we're constantly trying to think about what is the relationship between information and who students are. Now that might, that might be a little bit uh, difficult of a concept to think about, um, but there is in fact a relationship, direct relationship between knowledge and perspective. So how one inhabits the world and how one walks through this world is, is kind of said to be relative. It's a little bit based on who you are. So we, we live in a time period where two people might have some different truths. And so this is something that enters into our classroom space readily and frequently. And rather than, than push it away, we, we seek to embrace it. So among the many resources that we have at the Center for Teaching Excellence, many of them are designed to foster best practices in the classroom, which is really something between you and the student. And we provide resources, thoughts, opportunities to come together in large groups of faculty to learn from each other. So a big portion of what we do in the Center for Teaching Excellence is dedicated to fostering a relationship with your peers that's, that's meant to bolster your teaching experience and the student's success in your classroom. So WP, the Center for Teaching Excellence, is a faculty development program. It's led by faculty for faculty. And it's meant for this lifelong pursuit that we have, uh, our desire to be the most effective teacher that we can be. Uh, my co-director, Dr. Brown, is in Scotland as we speak. Um, and she's unable to be here. But come the 25th, she will be here in full force. We're located, uh, of all places, on this website, wpunj.edu slash CTE. We have a staff assistant who is actually a graduate assistant who will be very responsive to, to your inquiries and we'll forward them to Dr. Brown and I and we're very prompt in getting back to you with all your needs related to any experience you're having in the classroom. Many people contact us because there are some students who they believe have more potential than what they're experiencing in their assessments. And so they might contact us so we can begin to think about what resources exist here on campus that could either work with the faculty member and the student, or just the student, or just the faculty member, or anything in between. So when you call upon the Center for Teaching Excellence, we'll, we also call upon you. We, we invite you to multiple venues that we host here on campus. Um, we create um, direct opportunities with faculty to interact through, for example, book clubs, teaching circles. Um, and we also do do private consultations. Uh, there have been many cases where you know, we receive emails from adjuncts, especially in their first year or two, who simply have a direct question about how something gets done on campus. Uh, we, we receive a lot of those, and we're happy to do so. But we're also happy to have more direct consultation if that's something that you feel could benefit you. Um, for whatever reason, uh, you, know, you, you write to the CTE website, and we'll get back to you with resources and a desire to engage more. We have had lots of, of peers contact us to conduct observations in their classes to get an objective perspective of what's going on. We're happy to do that. Um, and we're also happy to create records for you to think about your own teaching. Some, you know, video reflection is a very popular mechanism right now. Um, it's similar to uh, instant replay for sports. You know, you get to watch what you actually did and you might learn a little bit more about what you thought happened versus what actually happened. So we're happy to facilitate that. Um, and we host a lot of workshops throughout the year. So if you ever see those three, those three letters, CTE, you'll know that it's, it's Liz and I and our staff and we're, we're simply engaging the community in something related to teaching and learning. 
we love hosting these book discussions. The last book that we hosted was Ibram X. Kendi's 400 Souls, and we read the book with about 40 faculty members in the College of Education. It was a wonderful experience, and we do this both in individual colleges and at the university at large. So please, again, stay tuned, look for those. We do do about one per semester, and it's open to, to everyone. We buy the book, we send it to you, and we get together and we discuss it. Um, there's also opportunities, as I mentioned, to engage in a teaching circle if that's something that you'd like to do. And um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be sending those via announcements and our own flyers that go to all faculty. Um, when CTE sends an email, we only send it to faculty. So it's typical that you'll receive emails from CTE, and I just want you to know the other recipients will be your peers. Um, so you know, on behalf of CTE, um, reach out anytime. Liz and I are very excited and, and happy to work with you. Um, particularly in your first couple of weeks, I imagine that there's going to be lots of questions that range from, um, you know, what does a syllabus look like? Where can I get it printed? Many of those questions can be directed to your chairs. Um, if, if your chair so chooses, they may direct them to us. But if you'd also like to include us, you know, we're happy to offer a second um, set of eyes. But always in general, uh, my advice is to work directly with your chair and any faculty who will oversee the class or classes that you'll be teaching. But certainly we're uh, an additional resource and we'll be seeing each other throughout the school year. So on behalf of CTE, welcome. And I hope you have a wonderful academic year. And if anything comes up, please let us know. CTE at WPUNJ.edu. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuentes. Uh, I, I just remembered, I, I brought my business cards here, and I know only two of you are in the College of Business, but I'll leave them here somewhere. Feel free to grab one. Um, the associate deans are always willing to help if you have any questions. Um, as David just mentioned, the chair is often a good point of contact if it's about a specific class, but, but anyone you can get in touch with can either help you directly or get you in touch with the right person. Um, about David's presentation, just real quick, uh, they offer many wonderful services. I recommend all of them to you, uh, but I know that sometimes there might be a time conflict because I'm assuming most, if not all, of you have other responsibilities as well in addition to teaching a, a course or two here at William Patterson. And it's, it's been a few years, uh, quite a few years, but I did that peer observation once, and it is humbling, I'll say that, <laughs> but it is a great experience to have someone who has been doing this for many years, if not decades, come to your class and just observe it. And even if it's online, there's ways to set that up that you can give someone observer access. Highly recommend it. Um, you really learn a lot of things from people that have that expertise in that area. And it's something that I encourage you to consider. Okay, we're now switching gears a little bit where what we've heard so far was a lot about um, you as the instructors. We will now hear in the next 30 minutes about the variety of support services we have for our students. And we had, I think, about a dozen or so new student orientations in the last two or three weeks. Uh, at everyone that I attended for College of Business students, I point out a few examples of where we support students in, in a variety of ways. But my summary is always in the now 21 years that I've been here, I don't think I've ever come across a situation where we did that have some office or some service available to support a student. So it is really important um, to be able to direct students to the right resources. Oftentimes students are not quite sure where they need to go. Sometimes they're reluctant to ask for help. And that's where you come in. Often you're the main point of contact for them. If they're in your classes, they may ask you about something. And that really is the purpose of the next session so that you learn about all those support services. And we have a panel. Um, there's Dr. Edward Owuzu Ansa. He is the uh, Dean of the Library, the Cheng Library here on campus. Then we will hear from Instruction and Research Technology and the Center for Teaching with Technology, represented by Patrick Ryan and Sina Bulak. Thank you so much for coming. And Linda Refsland, uh, Dr. Refsland is the Executive Director for Academic Success Services. That's a fancy title for all the things we do to help students re-enroll, figure out financial aid, whatever it is they talk to Linda. That's basically what your job description is, isn't it? 
<laughs> At least it looks like that from my perspective. We work with Linda together a ton. As a little side note, the cooperation between the offices, different units on campus is really, really good. Everyone is ultimately here to help students succeed. Uh, so with, with that, I'll turn it over to the three of you. And I'll pull up the respective presentations here so that you have this handy. I, I don't know if you discussed in which order you want to go. I was not here last year, so I don't know how the panel was I mean, actually set. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No Thank worries. You. I was ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Got all excited. Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Refsland. Um, Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so as Dr. Gridge mentioned, my title is very long. It's very unclear. The, the general rule of thumb is that I am the chief nudger of students. Um, if you don't know who to email, generally the rule of thumb is you email me. Um, and that's perfectly OK. That's what my office is set up to do. Um, and so what I wanted to really go over with everybody is kind of a brief picture of some of the support services that we have for students, um, as well as some things that you might think about how you could incorporate them into your course um, as appropriate as other resources that students can use independently, um, as independent of going to a campus office or to see a person directly. Um, so one of the first big pieces, and this is a shift if, if you've been on our campus before, is we're shifting our student success platform to Navigate. Um, the, so for most students, they're going to be able to download it as an app on their phone. Um, for staff folks, there's a link. Um, everybody's already been pushed into the site, so the site is live. Um, it's something that on the student side is designed as a way for us to give students a centralized place to schedule appointments with anybody that they need to, see who their team members are, so who's their advisor, who's their financial aid counselor, who's their chairperson, um, who, if they belong to a cohort like veterans or honors, who are their people in their, their team. Um, it also allows you as faculty to also see those team members. Um, it's a space where students can access, um, and this is one of the features that we're going to try to share, particularly because it applies to both our in-person students and our online students, um, a study buddies feature, which um, essentially sets up students to be able to communicate with their peers in your class by class. You have to do nothing. Um, it turns itself on. If I'm a student and I go into my psych course, I'm a psychologist by training, so I always go to that. Um, I'm in Psych 1100. I don't know what's going on. I can literally just click Study Buddies and say, hey, is anybody up to help, you know, let's, let's cram for the next exam. And other students will get a ping and they can say, oh, yeah, no, I'm up for that. Here, let's meet. Um, and this is something that we haven't had a great architecture to help students do before um, outside of faculty having to do a lot of running around and creating groups and chats and all sorts of things so this is something we're really excited about um, for our academic support and tutoring options there's a wide range of both in-person and remote options um, the short version is that between all of our options students pretty much have a way of getting support in just about anything at just about any time. Um, we have a site license for tutor.com for our students, so students do not pay for tutoring. They don't pay for any of these services. Um, tutor.com is something that you can go type in and do a search on the web and find, but our students are going to access it through Blackboard so that we're paying for it, not them. Um, it provides live support across a extremely wide range of subjects. Um, it also offers students can submit papers and get feedback in you know asking a question of hey d is my thesis clear um, and have somebody really work with them around content um, they can do practice quizzes across a range of options they can see an academic coach about stress management they can it, if you think about sort of the architecture of supporting a student academically they have an option um, 
for our students who are English language learners, they have um, the ability to pivot the language, the host language, to Spanish. Um, so if they're just having a moment and they really just kind of <laughs> want to really talk to somebody and have that comfort level in a content area, they also have that ability to do that. We have our brick and mortar centers. Um, the Academic Success Center is our prime sort of core a competency center that covers a lot of territory across our 1,000 and 2,000 level courses. They're hosted very kindly by, by Edward in the library on the main floor. Um, they also have online hours and uh, remote hours to expend their time that they can work with students. Our science enrichment center uh, works with primarily STEM majors, but students have science as part of their core classes, so they work with those students as well. And that's housed, the brick and mortar part is housed in Science Hall East 3023. Um, again, also have remote options for students on weekends and evenings to expend, extend when we're working with students. Um, our writing center is in Grant Hall on the main level in 124, also has online. Um, we'll work with students across a range, so they work with undergraduate, graduate students, um, across a range of writing options and at all stages of writing and all content areas, so they're not limited. They can, if I'm writing a paper in anthropology, I can absolutely work with that center. Um, it's not limited to just English class content. Let me figure out how to scroll. Um, we also have our math center, which is also located in Science Hall, and I'm forgetting the room, honestly, right now, and I'm looking at Mel. 3036, thank you. Um, that works primarily, again, with our, our mid-range and upper-range mathematics courses, as well as a computer science center that is focusing on students who are computer science and CIT majors and those major courses. Um, we also believe that students should be accessing other materials um, and utilizing particularly resources around how to develop their study skills, how to develop their learning skills. Um, and for some students, this is a really big adjustment if you're teaching, if your course is going to be, you know, covering sort of first in their family to go to college, this is their first semester, this may be a very big change for them. Um, and so these are just a range of options of really nice strategy-based videos that I found really helpful for students, um, things that I've recommended for students. Um, the also, um, tutor.com also provides support around skills. So if a student really is struggling with note-taking, they can work with somebody around that. It's not just focused on content support, it's also broad skill support. Um, and again, depending on your content area that you're working with, it really may be a skill that's going to be most helpful for that student as opposed to pure content tutoring. Um, there are also, and everybody who's been on the internet has found Khan Academy at some point, has found a range of options where practice, and particularly if you're teaching content areas where practice is key, um, mathematics in particular is sort of the hallmark of this, where there is no way regardless of how brilliant I am, I cannot sit in a 45 minute class and suddenly no math. Um, and so really thinking about how you can help students access practice sites um, is sometimes really critical for those procedural content areas um, and giving them those abilities to access those materials. Um, I'm also a fan of providing um, pre-reading or support materials for content that students may be unfamiliar with. Um, so philosophy is kind of a hallmark course for students who have a lack of familiarity. My apologies to the philosophy professors in the room. Um, that students come from high school and they immediately are like, I don't know what this is, I freak out, I want out of this class. And one of the great strategies that we've had is there are some really fabulous um, low stress tutorials to really talk about what philosophy, for example, is. One of my personal favorites is Crash Course. Um, it's a video series that's put on by PBS. I refer to it as sort of Sesame Street for adults. Um, it's built by brilliant instructional designers. It is designed for learning. Um, it's visual, it's exciting, it's also presented by experts in the field. And so it may be a great way that, you know, before you're starting to talk about Plato or Socrates or reading something that's really in depth but maybe challenging is to say, let's explore some context so that you can breathe deeply and now let's read this primary source and have a moment with it together. Um, LinkedIn Learning is a service that um, the institution is paying for and is access is accessible to all of us, but also provides fabulous 
um, online learning opportunities across a range of skills. If you have a student who's really excelling in your course and is like, I want to know more about this, and it's just not part of your course yet, that might be a great space to point them to so that they can really start developing that skill and independently start learning more. Again, particularly if you're teaching in a procedural subject where they maybe can go ahead a little bit and, and explore some things and, and have some interest in it. Um, there are also a range of study apps and tools and support options, particularly for students' phones, um, to help them build their own practice experiences. Um, oftentimes, that's something that students are thinking that, oh, I'm just going to read my notes over and over and over again, and that's how I'm going to learn. And that's not how anybody learns. Um, and so providing a recommendation, and if you have ones that are favorites for you, is saying, hey, not only are we going to talk about what our content is, but we're going to talk about how to best to learn that content. And if you have experience where you're like, this is what did it for me, that's something that would be a great to introduce into your class and integrate into that material. Are we doing questions at the end? I'm looking at my panel. <laughs> I think you should, if anybody has any questions, they should hit me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> questions. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a set of materials I typically send students every semester. I also have a set of websites um, that are for faculty, staff, and students that has a range of these kinds of things. It also gives some options. I believe the provost talked about early assessment and things like that. Um, it also gives some examples of great early assessment options, how to design um, feedback loop assignments with academic support. So yeah, it has that stuff too. Definitely, okay. and it's all, it's under academic support services. If you go to the main WPU webpage, um, academics, and then academic support services, you'll see one of those options is resources for faculty. And also the permission from the speakers, the associate dean would provide mm -hmm. copies of the presentation to all participants. Yes, Thank you, Mark. Perfect. Send away. Um, and as usual, when in doubt, just if you have a question, email me, pop down. My office has moved again, <laughs> for those of you who know me. Um, I'm in the lower level of Robinger Hall in the Advisement Center. Um, so visitors are welcome, phone calls, email, I'm not particular. Very nice to meet everyone. I don't know what presentation is up next. I'll grab it. Oh, yeah, because I think the PowerPoint's up. All right, everybody. I'm Patrick Ryan. I'm the acting director for IRT. I'm going to talk about IT stuff today. So <laughs> following me is going to be Sienna, and she's going to, Senna, and she's going to be uh, talking about the instruction research technology resources, all the good stuff. So first thing you need to know with IT is the help desk. Um, it's, it's, via, it's, it's accessible via the web. Let me see if this thing is pointing. Nice, nice. So there you go. You got the web help desk there. It's also a phone number, so you can dial help. So those last four digits spell out help, so that's really easy to remember. Um, but really, there's, there's anything you need help with with technology. It's on that help desk. It's, there's a drop-down menu. You can get almost anything answered. And it's, if you're not sure about something like software, hardware, just put it in there, our tech staff. It, it'll navigate to the right person. And then the next thing you know with IT, we've got a portal, and it's called WB Connect, and it's accessible via our, our website, and it's got everything on it. So like one page, almost anything that you can think of, it's there. This is roughly the look of it. Um, for you guys, there's a faculty and advisors tab, which is great, it's right over there on the side, and that's gonna give you your faculty schedule, early alert, which is our starfish system there, um, degree evaluation, and attendance tracking. In the employee tab, which might be great so you guys are new, um, you got your HR profile. Um, if you didn't get parking stickers yet, you want to get those, you can sign up there. You got HR forms, direct deposit, and then they've recently added this my document upload, which has been great. 
And then there's the information technology tab that we put on there. Um, you get banner financial information, another access to that help desk system we talked about, which you're going to need or not need if we're doing real well. Um, and then there's an IT wiki. And this is kind of important. This is a searchable repository. So if you're having trouble with your phone, you just plug in phone, and it'll give you some instruction. Um, if you want to do 3D printing, plug in 3D printing. It'll tell you all about how there's 3D printing in the library. Um, and our students get involved in it, the faculty get involved in it. And there's also virtual reality there, too. So anyway, check out the IT wiki, subjects that you want, and maybe even some resources we didn't talk about you might find. All right, another thing. This is, um, this is my boss, Gammon. She is the CIO of, of uh, our organization. Um, this is just the right side of that WP Connect portal. And there's these little icons here, which are great. Um, you've got uh, an opportunity to lead us feedback. You got mail. You got your Blackboard shortcut. But my favorite one is this one right here, and it's the WP Apps menu. And it's got all those icons, so like Starfish and LinkedIn. Um, what else? It's got Office 360, Microsoft Office Download. And then this Duo authentication, um, this is real important. I'll just kind of take a moment. There's a video on it, too. But if you're going to log into something, they're going to want to push you a notification to your cell phone or office phone. And there's instructions on how to do that. But that's real important. And then here's some more resources. Um, we use Qualtrics for surveys. We have a license, so you can kind of create surveys. It's great. Um, mentioned LinkedIn Learning, which is a great resource for if you wanted to learn Adobe Premiere, you can, you can spend weeks on that. Um, and then the Tutor.com, which is accessible through Blackboard, which is Dynamite. Zoom, you might have heard of that. We use it here. Usually it might be something you haven't heard of, and that's a video repository. And that's, that's maintained here at the university, so we've got... Uh, you know, basically copyright-free material for, for everybody, or if, there's, if it's copyright, we paid for it and you can use it. Um, we might talk a little bit more about this, but we use this within Blackboard because you want to put large files up on Blackboard, or large video files. And then finally, before I turn it over to Senna, uh, Instruction Research Technology, all three units of our, our department support faculty. So even though, like, students are the most important to all of us, you know, my department is really focused towards you, the faculty. Um, the three divisions, there's the classroom uh, technical support. They're the folks that are going to fix all this equipment and come to your classroom if there's a problem. Um, and you'd call that help number and you'd get somebody. Um, the broadcast production support team, they're really a specialized team. They're recording us right now. Um, you might have saw some robotic cameras in here. Um, they take care of the communication department, athletic, PA systems, anything advanced, that team helps. And you might see them in one of your classrooms or one of your events recording something. And then the Center for Teaching with Technology is the best, and that's where Santa comes in. So she's going to take us home. Is there any other questions? Yes. This may seem like a silly question. What is Starfish? Ah, I don't know tons about Starfish. That's Hey, I knew that's what it was, but I don't know the advanced nature of it. But on a personal level, I want to point out to you, there's another Patrick Ryan here. He's, he's my son. So if you ever run into another Patrick Ryan, he just started last year as a freshman. He's coming back as a sophomore. So be kind. <laughs> Is there any other questions? All right, Santa. Hello everyone, um, welcome to William Patterson University. My name is Sena Bulak and I am an instructional designer at Center for Teaching with Technology. We are part of IRT department and um, you may uh, hear us about um, Blackboard's team as well because my team uh, specifically focuses on Blackboard. And our office is located in IR2 suite in the library. So um, 
My team focuses on uh, course design and uh, teaching solutions. So we are helping faculty to develop, design and develop their courses, especially online courses. But uh, as we encourage faculty, even if they're teaching in-person courses, we encourage them to use Blackboard and keep all the resources and uh, gradings in Blackboard as well. We, uh, regardless of the format of the course, we help faculty. Um, with any questions, you can contact us from uh, objective creations to how to design and build your assignments or classroom activities or how we are going to increase student engagement in online classes. A lot of things, including technical aspects of it. So a few services we provide is uh, webinars. We offer uh, several uh, webinars in various topics, uh, weekly webinars, sometimes three, uh, four times a week. And sometimes we offer actually certification programs uh, once or twice a year. One uh, certification program is going to start next week and it's going to take two days. Uh, it's about quality of online education. And this week we had a uh, certification program again. It was about accessibility. So uh, different topics, uh, you may receive emails from us uh, and you can just like register. If you have any specific questions, for example, you would like to learn how to use Blackboard or how to use some feature of Blackboard, you can always uh, email us or create a help desk ticket to schedule a consultation services. Uh, it is one-on-one -on -one consultation service, and um, with my t in my team we have we are four instructional designers. Uh, we would be happy to assist you with any questions that you have. You can also, for quick questions, you can always create a help desk uh, ticket. Uh, today, I also would like to mention a little bit about how to access Blackboard. Uh, Patrick mentioned we can uh, access from BP Connect by using this icon, but there is also a direct link to access in case uh, WP Connect website is not working or you just want to just directly write the URL. And there is also a mobile, mobile app that you can use. Uh, it is recently updated, so it is working pretty well not uh, as well as the desktop, but you can sometimes just visit your classes for checking, to check something very quickly. And in here, uh, this is the page that you see when you first sign in to your Blackboard. And you can access your courses by clicking this courses icon from the navigation panel. Uh, we just recently updated our Blackboard, so it is, uh, it has very beautiful features that can help you, and it's very good to explore. If you would like to learn more about it, please just contact us, and we would be happy to go over about these new features. And the mobile app, you can, again, use uh, this tab to reach your courses. And this is a little closer look. I copied this here because I want to show this institution page here. Uh, in this institution page, you can see some resources, some resources about Blackboard and some other ca campus resources, especially uh, Blackboard, Blackboard for faculty, Blackboard for students, and even uh, Help Desk link is here. So you can just uh, use these links to directly go to our uh, support documentations on IT Wiki page. And these are also direct links to IT wiki pages. I recommend you to visit the faculty page. And in order to request help uh, in the help desk system, you can select Blackboard. And it directly comes to my team, and we help you with your questions. And this is my team, and there are like some contact information. Uh, it's also available on our website. So please feel free to reach out to us anytime if you have any technical questions, 
regarding Blackboard or some other technology you want to utilize in your classroom. I think that's all. Thank you so much, everyone. And again, welcome. Well, they left the best for last, <laughs> but they gave me no time to dazzle you. So let's rush through this, all right? <laughs> okay. Now, everybody here knows what a library is. You've been to a library. If you're sitting here, you've been to a library. <laughs> so <laughs> that's quite obvious. This is the William Patterson page. I'm not even going to go to my PowerPoint. That makes no difference. I just run through very fast for you because I might have a minute or two. Where not here. Just get into the library. Very simple. You're all academics and you know how to get to academics, right? And right there under here, academic resources, library. All I want you to notice here is when you come to library, basically for your purposes, you want to go to resources for you. Now, you are not an undergraduate. You are not grad, um, some of you may also be doing some grad, but your faculty and staff, right? So this is basically where you want to come. Most of the time I would have gone through similar stuff, right? The two things I really, really, really want to point you to, and that is library instruction. I know a lot of people don't avail themselves of that because you don't have time, you have to finish this content and stuff like that. But please, we have a very dynamic team that will work with you to create resources within your own Blackboard shell, within your own course, so that you don't necessarily have to sacrifice time. Though if you do have the time, you will be amazed how better off students are when they get that kind of um, direct guidance. But So try that. But uh, you go in there, you'll be able to fill out forms and stuff like that and request a class. But they would also work with you to incorporate things into your Blackboard site and that might be maybe what you want to do. The other thing I wanted to point out was your liaison program. We have library liaisons in the various departments, whatever department you are, and if you go to our liaison program, they have the name of the librarian assigned to your departments if you wanted to request books, um, videos, uh, you know, streaming video, whatever it is, you go to that person, right? You don't necessarily have to go through your department. but. There are times when maybe you want to have conversations with your departmental representative. That is, let's say if you're in communications, the communications professor who is assigned to the library might be able to give you some advice on that. You may want to talk to that person. A lot of times, as I just, you may not even find that person. So just go to this site and go directly to the librarian who is your liaison person, right? And we have a liaison directory. And as you can see, not all departments have assigned departmental liaisons to the library, but the library has departmental liaison to every department. So just go there and check this person out. Now, I'll get out of here, and my plug usually is, this day and age is this. You know, I might need a second pair of glasses. Open educational resources. I'm not their prophet, but I encourage you. Students are already loaded with expenses and stuff like that. You know, they need that car because it's the most important thing in the world. They'll even take a student loan and use half of it to buy a car. So, but they'll tell you that the textbook costs 250, my God. <laughs> so <laughs> if you can help them, I'm sure you're all familiar with open educational resources. Usually the question is, are they good enough? I generally say, you look at schools like Berkeley, and the, they use a lot of open educational. Rice University is big on that. I think if University of Berkeley likes it, UCLA likes it, I think we could use it. So, but it is, it, it is your discretion. Go, check it out, find, and if you find something you like, but don't like everything in it, you can mix it up and stuff like that. That's the nature of the open environment. You create your own textbook. You don't have to write it. Just pick whatever chapters you want from whoever wrote and stuff like that and create your own unique 
version of it, but it's very helpful to students. Generally, we know that approximately 40% of students never buy a textbook. That's a national statistic. They don't buy it. They don't want it. And a lot of them would buy it within after the first eight weeks of class. Yeah. The semester is almost over. So please, if you can help them out and make sure these resources are already there, they can be within your environment, you can be on your web page, wherever you want to put it, and they have it up front and you give them perhaps a better chance of connecting with you. Now, what I would say is we have some resources there. If you go for resources for you, you'll find some of these where we do provide some guidance for creating uh, open educational resources. We do provide support if you need it, even in writing and stuff like that. We can even help you uh, with the writing and the mounting of the, uh, of the book and stuff, if that's what you're interested in. But let's face it, in the academy, 95 plus percent of instructors, of professors, are textbook adopters, not textbook writers. So we don't expect you to write a textbook. Just go there, find what you like, see if it fits within your profession, and please use it. I see one of the organizers in the back looking at his watch, which tells me, Edward, you better shut up. <laughs> so I am going to shut up. My name is Edward Owusu-Ansa, but please, you can call me Edward. Don't forget about the last name. When I first got here, first time in the library, a lady, one of the librarians comes to me and she goes, um, Edward, uh, I said, come on, call me Edward. And she goes, oh my God, I spent three weeks practicing that name. <laughs> and you walk here, call me Edward. And I call me Edward, call me Eddie, call me Teddy, call me Ted, whatever you want. Just don't call me Mr. Ed. <laughs> That's all I care for, right? Thank you so much, and you have a great time. All right, thank you, Ed, Eddie, Teddy, Edward. <laughs> you want to go away today, and, and Sena and Patrick and Linda. Uh, the, the, these folks are really great resources in this. Um, Mel mentioned earlier, we will share all the you know, materials this year with the links and everything so that you have access to that because just seeing it on the screen really you know, doesn't get you very far. We realize that. Okay, so. Um, the, the, the next item on the agenda, it's a presenta uh, presentation from Yolani Gonell. She's the director of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. And if you look around the room, we're a pretty diverse crowd. If you look in your classes when you start teaching or walk around campus, we have a very diverse student population. We're a minor minority serving institution, we're a Hispanic serving institution. Um, the, not all schools are like that. There are other schools in New Jersey that have a similar profile. New Jersey City University, for example, their student body is fairly comparable to ours, but others are not. Um, I'm not going to name examples, but if you kind of think about the list and then, you know, what the provost mentioned earlier uh, about access, whom we include versus exclude, et cetera, there's examples of that. So you'll see that in your classroom that uh, we really have students from all walks of life, some international students, uh, often students that are from here, but they may be first generation immigrants. A lot of them are first generation college students, and I think that really um, makes a difference in terms of, you know, how they go through the process and how they go through their classes. Uh, but rather than me telling you about all those things, uh, how diverse our students are, the services we provide for them, and how we include them in the many things that we do, I'll hand it over to Yolani, who will tell you exactly what her center does. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Yolani Ganell. I use she and her pronouns, and in my capacity, I do serve as the Director for Student Diversity and Inclusion. I'm very delighted to be here, and before I get started into this presentation, um, I wanted to just share a few acknowledgments. I'm here on behalf of the Chief Diversity Officer, David, uh, Dr. David Jones. Um, and so we co-prepared this presentation. So we'll be talking about um, how do we create inclusive classrooms for, uh, and classroom environments for our students. And the second acknowledgement that I wanted to make is that uh, William Patterson University um, has adopted land acknowledgments. And we will be uh, doing a lot of education around land acknowledgments beginning this year. And so I wanted to introduce you to what that looks like and what that sounds like. So today, we recognize that we reside on the Lenape Hoking, 
the traditional land of the Lenape people, past and present. We acknowledge the Lenape people as the indigenous stewards of this colonized land, and also the spiritual keepers of the Lenape Supi, River of the Lenape people, or Delaware River. We commit to supporting the Lenape people by building relationships and solidarity with the Lenape people, recognizing their continuing presence and respecting and honoring the original caretakers of this land. And what that means for us is really making a concerted effort to build relationship with our external partners, but also to think about how do we then engage with the community to recruit and retain students who identify as indigenous or Native American. Right? And this is a big deal for us. So again, um, later on, you'll get some announcements. Uh, October 10th, right, um, is we're going to have a proclamation ceremony, which is honoring Indigenous Peoples Day. And so there will be um, some remarks. And then we're working with our Shea Performing Arts Center to have uh, a visiting artists come and perform, right, to close that day. And then later on in November, we have our Native American Heritage Celebration. The Native American Heritage Celebration um, started a few years ago, right? And I started working here in fall of 2019. I serve as the inaugural director. And um, later on, I'll talk more about our centers and how we got established. But thank you so much for listening to that piece around our land acknowledgement. Um, and the third thing I'll say in terms of acknowledging is acknowledging you acknowledging the wisdom and the talent that you bring to the space. And I encourage you to engage with me in this presentation to share some of your reflections and some of the guided prompts, right? So I'm gonna share information with you and if you have additional contributions, we welcome that. So um, our intended outcomes, and um, it's really to understand the importance of creating an inclusive classroom environment here at William Patterson, think about some effective strategies um, as we look at the diversity of our students and some of the um, experiences that they bring with them, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be responsive um, and um, what you might consider for this year. And again, um, I'm gonna begin to close the information on the university uh, diversity priorities, particularly the ones that the chief diversity officers focus on. And I'll spend a very few minutes on just talking about some of the things that we're doing for student diversity and inclusion, all right? So let's ground our conversation about why this is important in the classroom. So what you're seeing here is data. And I always like to share this even with our students to kind of think about why this is important to me and my office. Um, so I always look at place of origin, right? And so we try, this information is for last year's um, enrollment for a first time first year students. And you'll see here that we had just shy of a thousand students. And when we look at the place of origin, what that tells me as a practitioner, right, it tells me a lot about where our students are from in the context of resources in those communities. So if you remember Hurricane Ida, right, um, if we know that 37% uh, of our students are from Passaic County, then that informs me as a practitioner, and I hope it will inform you as a, a faculty member, that if there's a, 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 a crisis or, or something that happened in the community, and we say, okay, what's happening in Passaic? A lot of our students from the Passaic um, County um, may have lost um, their homes, may have flooding in their basements, may have had issues commuting to class or going to work that day, may have had other um, impacts that were related to the pandemic as well. Right, so we think about, well, how is that student's lived experience at home and in the community affecting their well-being and their mindset in the classroom? Right, and that's what it means to be culturally responsive, right? To really pay attention to who your students are um, and recognizing all parts of their identities in that space. We're looking here to um, the gender reported, right? One of the things that's so critical to share is that, you know, historically we haven't done a really good job in acquiring information about uh, ex gender expansive communities, right? Those who are in non-binary, transgender and non-binary students. Uh, we began to do a lot of this work in probably the last five, maybe even 10 years, 
right? You'll see that in 2017, Campus Climate Survey was uh, put out to get some information about how students identified, and we were able to see that 12.9% at the time um, do not define their sexuality as heterosexual, and then over time, one of the things that I'm really proud about is that as students were talking about some of the challenges in their classroom of being misgendered or not having their pronouns respected um, by peers or faculty, right? And I'm being really transparent with y'all, right? So these are our lived experiences. We're not gonna grow if we don't share these uh, materials. And so because of this um, activism and students showing up and, you know, the commitment that um, our leaders have on campus, when they updated um, Blackboard, now with Blackboard Ultra that you'll have access to, you'll be able to see your students' pronouns. And you'll be able to also add your own pronouns to that site as well so that all students can connect, connect with you that way. I'll tell you that we have a very growing and expansive community that identifies transgender and non-binary on our campus. So I want to share that with you because it's so critical to the work that we're doing, right? Um, I want you to take a look at our student enrollment data. Again, um, just a big glance. The, the, the images are too small, so I'll kind of point to a few things. This information was given to us by institutional data. I didn't make any of this up, right? So these are actual facts. Um, and what's really key about this uh, is right here, you'll see on the side, the highest enrollment of students of color are in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Science. And so you'll see a top on the top part, um, it's broken down by gender, right? And so the first uh, set of uh, roles, in, excuse me, the columns is male. Um, for those in this space that may um, have uh, different vision capacities or impairment, um, it is slightly color coded, but you won't be able to see it on this screen. And so uh, we're looking at M for male and then gender F for female. Um, you're not gonna see non-binary identities within this chart. Um, you're also looking to see here that white women rank the highest enrollment in the College of Education with 200 students followed by Latinx, Latina and Latinx students at 134. Uh, we also paid attention to, you know, what's our uh, Asian student experience? If you remember um, how the pandemic started, right, of the xenophobia that our faculty and students were experiencing in the community um, informs us of how they're uh, showing up in the classroom. Do they feel safe? Do they see, feel valued? Do they feel seen? So we wanted to just point that out. Like, you know, we had 17 Asian students collectively in the College of Education. And you look across the board um, and all the populations you know, we're seeing these numbers. We're not really seeing high numbers of Native American students. Earlier, you you saw that there might have been one. And so I'm tracking those numbers as well. Um, and so one, the last point that you'll see here is that white students collectively are enrolled at higher rates um, than peers in the College of Science and Health, right? And that's critical because we're talking about how do we create these inclusive, um, uh, not inclusive, but also uh, culturally responsive spaces, right? So if you're in a class where majority of your students are all women, or you're in a class where majority of students are all white, we want you to kind of think about how might you uh, fold in inclusive authors and uh, a varied representation in the coursework. And so that open resource and um, the solutions that you heard earlier in, in earlier presentations, that's when that kind of comes in as a solution. Um, I asked a question, you know, what are the top three majors by ethnicity and gender of um, particularly looking at black, um, Latino, male and females? And, you know, what you see here is that by large, uh, for black women and Latino women, nursing uh, ranks number one. Right, nursing ranked number one for both uh, for those population, right? And so that's really awesome, right? Imagine if you're in that uh, space. That that means that we're really seeing um, a trajectory for our students in the STEM field, and I love that. Uh, we're also seeing that for Black men, um, you know, criminal criminology and criminal justice is um, is a again even with uh, women. 
um, is an area of interest, um, and then you're, you're seeing uh, finance and computer science, right? I'd love to uh, do more around STEM. Uh, this summer, we did a, a presentation for students who are in the STEM, uh, excuse me, an uh, Aspire uh, program for the STEMs. And a beautiful group of students, and we talked about, again, how to, uh, how to engage on campus and um, find mobility in, the, in their workforce, right? We show data, but I want to remind you, this is who our students are. So as you interact with information um, these next few days as part of your orientation or as you uh, engage with your department, please remember that these are our students and that these numbers are attached to names um, and experiences, right? And this is part of our I Am William Patterson campaign that we uh, started in 2019. We are going to have a diversity fair on October 19th which is a Wednesday from, uh, I want to say, noon to 3 o'clock or so. So if you are teaching a class around that time or if you're here on campus or if you want to just um, engage your students with extra credit, this is a great way for you to engage them at least for their first, their first experience with diversity, right? So we have that fair. We'll have a photographer who's going to continue the campaign. So I'll start with this before we get into <coughs> engaging you and, and getting your reflection. Um, one of the things that I'm really mindful about is that the institution makes a lot of promises to our students. And as you heard from Provost Powers, we're really trying to cultivate a space where students feel a sense of belonging, where they are um, resilient, where they have mental uh, m uh, growth mindset, and are receiving support, right, academically, but also um, um, based on their well-being. These promises are based on our values, all right? And uh, I know that there are a group of people here on our campus that we're working to formulate new mission statements and diversity statements. But one of the things I'll tell you now is that a lot of our students are attracted to William Patterson University because of those values and those promises. What happens that affects student sense of belonging is this notion around perception. If a student perceives that they don't matter because of a microaggression that happened in the classroom, because of being misgendered in the classroom, or um, feeling like their ideas or perspectives are dismissed that maybe don't align with you know, the larger group, right? their, sense, their perception is, I'm not welcomed here. Right, and that's one of the issues that impacts retention and impacts um, that student from wanting to return back into a classroom, right? So, and also in the residence halls. But in, in this space, right, we're talking about the classroom experience. So our goal is to really think about sense of belonging because we want to increase student retention and we want to increase student success. So reflection. This is where I like for you to kind of think about some of the work um, and resources that you heard earlier, um, but also some of the things I just shared with you now. Um, what does it mean to have an inclusive learning environment? What does that mean to you? I'd love to maybe hear from one or two people who would be willing to share that. Um, I think oh, can you uh, say your name and, your, and if you're willing to share your pronouns? I really thank you for sharing that. I like that you put some action into, like, make people feel welcomed by, right? Uh, acknowledging them, you know, practicing pronouns, um, and also addressing issues as they arise, like, you know, like resp being um, responsive, right? Um, anyone else? 
have an additional perspective to share about what they think an inclusive learning environment is? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is uh, Steven. I use he and him. Um, another thing to think about is like questioning how Eurocentric your curriculum is. Uh, the social science, particular, like I'm doing psychology, and it was interesting to see the statistic that it's uh, mm -hmm. the, like, the number two major among uh, black and Hispanic women. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that would increase my incentive to you know, question how uh, how many German names like we're seeing in the foundations of psychology Excellent. and how we should include like a, I don't know, the Francis Charles Sumner who mm -hmm. created the psychology department at Howard University, the biggest H H HBCUs, Excellent. or um, acknowledging how a lot of like things we think of as like objectives such as uh, perception. Right. Um, is actually uh, culturally based. The, the, the Mueller liar illusion, where um, it, it, it's basically the length of lines, mm -hmm. and like, and if the if the edges of your lines they fan out, it'll look bigger than the ones that uh, kind of bend in. I hope you know what I'm describing because <laughs> uh, that really only applies to industrialized nations where we're used to buildings that have uh, square corners. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like where we're defining like very industrialized architecture, and not so much in like traditional or, or other rural communities. So, Excellent. like broadening, uh, like what kind of like like questioning what kind of assumptions your curriculum is based on, and how that the experience is broader. Excellent. Anyone else? Uh, well, you and then someone in the back. Mm -hmm. I'm Jessica. Um, she her her um, I'm the dean for like um, healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And like acknowledging how like um, that would have impacted societies before, mm -hmm. and how can we kind of use that moving forward? Right. How can we be better as practitioners and clinicians? Excellent. Right. And we. Uh this past March, we had a, for Women's History Month, we did a presentation on the determinants of health and how that uh, the discrepancies there across, you know, that racial discrepancies. Right. So thank you so much for offering that. In the back. I also think it's really important to create an environment where people feel safe enough to speak up and mm -hmm. to openly express that they yes. have experienced microaggression or to feel safe enough to correct you mm -hmm. and for the other people in the room to feel safe enough to receive that correction mm -hmm. and not have an embarrassment around it and not feel like they need to explain themselves or anything right. other than the loving sort of dialogue that happens between people who respect and who, um, yeah, who want to learn more and who want to get better. Excellent. And so how, um, how might we do that? We'll talk about that in just a moment. I see someone here in the middle. Um, my name is Michelle, and I go by um, she, her, hers. Uh, I think especially for those of us who teach undergrad, it's really important to have that public school education, right. or not even public school education, like K through 12 education, and so the emphasis on like writing or the expectations of your students, you have to be more open and inclusive because someone may have had, a, you know, a, I guess, different level of education yes. in certain subject matters, yes. and that would impact their ability to understand and succeed in your own class if you have, if you hold everyone to that same expectation, especially if you compare it to maybe what your education was like mm -hmm. K through 12. Excellent. All right, and you raised a good point, right? That's why we looked at the place of origin, right? If you're familiar with New Jersey, you know that there are certain school districts in New Jersey that are under resources, underfunded. And if our students are coming from these schools, we have to know that there is uh, we're not measuring intelligence based on um, a, a standardized test, right? We're looking at the, the process of learning, right, and growth, right? And then you have your test to see where are they developmentally and, and where then do we connect them with tutoring, with additional support services that you heard earlier. I'm going to move us along because we have just a few more minutes. And so um, this is a diagram. Um, of why inclusive pedagogy in the classroom environments are important. Uh, and you'll see in here that we really talk about the dimen identity dimensions and again, how those social factors 
um, impact that students experience, right? And many of you already mentioned that, so we're not going to get into this. But this um, chart that you see here is the same um, diagram that I show students when we do our training around social justice and we talk about identity development and we talk about power and privilege so that they also um, have a, uh, there's a, what's the word, alignment and a congruence with what they are seeing in the world and how they're kind of doing their self-narrative about how, um, how they're accepted or not accepted in certain communities, right? So um, let me move these ahead. Uh, traditional learning environments um, can sometimes be disconnected from identities. Um, and this is a piece that uh, David Jones put together. And one of the key things that I pretty much, um, that, that I really appreciate is the bullet number two. Right, too often the focus is on assimilation of students into the dis, uh, disciplinary culture, which reflects traditional norms and values of the dominant group, right? And this is a little bit of what we just heard now from a member of our audience, right? Um, instructors incorrectly portray subjects as a finished bodies of knowledge, which does not allow students to construct their own meaning or make unique contributions to the discipline, right? Again. Um, and this goal, I want to say to the person here in the middle who also made the contributions around being mindful about who our authors are and um, those perspectives. Uh, culture is central to learning. It plays a role not only in communicating and receiving information, but also in shaping the thinking process of groups and individuals. Um, and culturally responsive teaching is a pedagogy that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural references in all aspects of learning. Right, and this is what we're asking you to consider. And um, as actors, you're like, you know, I have but so much time to, um, to coordinate to get, uh, get set up. But one of the things that we heard today is that we have folks in the CTE program, uh, TTE department, right? And we also have members in the library group who can help streamline some of that research and some of those materials. So if you want to diversify your curriculum, you want to, um, think more differently about the reading materials than maximize uh, the resources that you heard today. Um, what does it take to create an inclusive classroom? We already heard from you today, so thank you so much for sharing your perspective and also your uh, recommendations. And what we'll say here is that we want you to be brave, creative, and challenging your own perspective and understanding, right? Students, like uh, Provost Power said, are going to respect you. They're not really concerned about your title. They just know you're their teacher, right? Like, that is very clear. And so, you know, know that there's self-work that we all need to do, right? Um, reconsider, refine your own teaching philosophy to, uh, so that it speaks to your diverse student audience, right? So what motivates you to be a teacher in that moment? You're going to have students that have different learning um, processing needs, that have different maybe um, communication styles that may have accents um, that, again, have very different lived experiences than your own. And so they're going to show up in a way that you might not be accustomed to. And this is part of the work that we ask you to consider engaging CTE or engaging the Chief Diversity Officer or myself to help you uh, come up with some strategies that, are, uh, that help you engage uh, with students that you might find um, challenging to work with for whatever reason, okay? So I just wanted to name that. Um, we got to uh, have the willing to empower students to self-direct their own learning, right? So you heard that from Linda earlier. You know, we have um, these tutoring, these apps, uh, websites that, again, we're engaging students to really be in charge of their own learning. There's only so much you can do, right? There's only so much flexibility. Uh, before you're like, you know what, I don't know if you're going to be succeeding in this classroom. We've given you some recommendations. You're not turning in your assignments. You're not contributing in the discussions, right? So you'll have to make those decisions. But before we get to that point, you know, how then does that culturally responsive teaching look like? In the back? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, I think it's great the inclusion. For me, at least, it helps so much to do icebreakers. Yes. It might be obvious. But I think like just starting that right off the bat, embracing their backgrounds, their yes. opinions, whatever it is, is crucial to creating that. Excellent, right? And and those icebreakers, we encourage you to do that day one, right? When you're reviewing your um, syllabus with them, my time um, is up. 
Okay? So we won't, we won't get into this, but you will have a copy of this presentation um, later, and we'll leave you with, again, uh, thinking about the action plans that you want to set. And with that, I turn it over. Thank you so much. Thank you.